mean a lot to others. I know, I know, it doesn't always feel like it. Not with the mortgages, the errands, the to-do list, the laundry, the shopping, and the cleaning. Rushing here and rushing there, running yourself ragged to accomplish things, only to wonder if you've really accomplished anything at all. But what if you could know? What if you could know exactly how much you mean to someone? Vulnerable children and families need hope now. Someone to help them, someone to encourage them, someone to walk alongside them. They need you. Since 1879, people like you and me have come together through Buckner International to improve the lives of children and families and enrich the lives of seniors around us. Together, we provide families for crucial moments through foster care or forever through the miracle of adoption. We strengthen families who are hopeless under the weight of oppressive poverty. Equipping vulnerable families with skills, we elevate them above their struggles. We inspire happiness in the lives of seniors, helping them live with purpose. When enough of us come together, our impact is multiplied. Every year, we transform the lives of more than 150,000 people through acts of grace, service, and love. That's a lot of hope. Families are stronger together. Hundreds of seniors are happier than ever, all because of you. You mean hope. And that means a lot to a whole bunch of people who need it today. I'm glad to be here and uh, thankful to uh, Pastor Pete for uh, giving me the opportunity to step in for him while he's out today. It's always a privilege to preach the gospel. Uh, I came to know Christ as my Savior when I was nine. I was baptized when I was 10, answered a call to ministry when I was 15, and preached the first time when I was 16. That was a five-minute sermon. Um, I, I, <laughs> you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't have any practice or training, so I saw my pastor go up to the pulpit with a Bible and some papers. I thought, well, that's what I need, a Bible and papers. So I wrote out my sermon in five pages, but I forgot to time myself, and uh, it was a great sermon for five minutes, you know, it was, it was gone. and the pastor walked up and he said, uh, Dr. Rudy Sanchez, he walked up and he put his arm around me and said what he meant to say was, and he went on for 20 more minutes, and I stood there and I said, but yeah, that's exactly what I had in mind, say amen, so <clears throat> I'll try to do better than that, but I won't, I won't go too long. So I bring you greetings from the Baptist World Alliance, uh, the, the uh, Cowboy Fellowship of Atascosa County is related to the Baptist Convention of Texas, and uh, we're part of that family. Globally, we are in 20, 241 uh, conventions, 126 countries, 47 million members, 169,000 churches, and so I bring you greetings on behalf of uh, the Baptist World Alliance uh, as well as Texas Baptist. What I'd like to talk to today is uh, the idea of hope now, and if you look on your uh, program, your bulletin, you'll see the the outline there, I'll kind of work my way through there from the Gospel of Luke chapter 10. <coughs> and, um, and so I, um, I don't know, I, I think that as I uh, live longer, uh, you know, we're at the end of another year and we come to the beginning of a new year. Um, if you're like me and you watch the news, there's some weird stuff going on around the, around the world and I don't have to surprise, I'm not going to surprise you or even go through all the different things, but it seems like we need hope, right, for a better future. And, and so if you came here today, you came to the right place because I think we're going to find hope, uh, hope now. Um, back in the 1960s, I was born in the late 50s, so in the early 60s, our nation had been rocked by a few things like the assassination of John F. Kennedy and then Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy. And there were just some really hard things our nation was going through. And there was a man by the name of Bart Bacharach who wrote a song. It was popularized by Aretha Franklin later in the 70s, but the title of the song was What the World Needs Now is Love, Sweet Love. You remember that? And, and, and really, Bart Bacharach, uh, was, he wrote the song as a prayer, and he was uh, writing it as a prayer to God. Remember, it says, you know, God, we don't need uh, another mountain. We don't need... Uh, another forest. We don't need more trees or rivers to cross, mountains to climb. We have enough of that. What we need is love. And uh, so the 1960s happened in the 1970s, and here we are 40 years later. I don't know if it worked. <laughs> I don't know if we're better. What I want to say, I want to revise uh, Bart's song and Aretha's song and say, no, I think what the world needs now is hope. Hope that it gets better. And I think that it was not that different in the first century with Roman rule 
and uh, the uh, Christian faith as it began as Jesus walked the earth even 2,000 years ago, I, I don't know that it was much different. It's just that now we know about it and we see it more often because of these, right? It's all in our faces now. And so, uh, but I think it's, it's still applicable today. So um, a couple of years back, <clears throat> I was uh, on a sabbatical. And so I didn't know you, you don't get a sabbatical till you stay for 10 years. So I left at seven, year seven, the previous two times and oops, well, missed the sabbatical. And I was at Buckner now for 10 years, and they said, we're going to give you a sabbatical. I said, what's that? I said, well, you, you know, you go away for six weeks and rest or study or whatever you want. So I called my mentor, Dr. Daniel Sanchez, and I said, I, I know you've been on sabbatical, so what do you do on a sabbatical? He goes, what do you want to do? I said, well, I want to write a book. He goes, no, 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 you don't write a book on a sabbatical. You research the book because you, you have plenty of time to write. You don't always have time to research. I said, okay. So he connected me to one of his colleagues, uh, Edward David Cook, the founder of the uh, biomedical Center for Biomedical Ethics at Oxford, and then also he founded the Oxford Center for Mission Studies. So we got connected, we talked. The first phone call, he says, well, Albert, by the way, where's Marguerite? Is Marguerite still here? Did she, she went off Children's Church. Okay, she's so nice, welcome me today. So kind of chased that rabbit and got it. So, okay, so <laughs> Dr. Cook said, what do you want to study? I said, well, okay, I named six things. He said, no, no, that's... That's way too much. We're going to be at, at Oxford for about a week. You had to you got to narrow it down. Call me back in two weeks. I called him back two weeks later, and I said I got it down to three things. He goes, way too much. You need to get specific. You know, get it, get it narrow. And so, <clears throat> call me back in two weeks. So I called him back the third time, and <clears throat> his question was, what precisely do you want to study? And so I started to answer, and he he interrupted me. He, uh, he interrupted my one answer I've been thinking about for six weeks, and he says, the problem with you Americans, I said, okay, <laughs> he said, the problem with you Americans is that you try to take something good and make it better, but that's not the Oxford way. I'm, I'm like, excuse me, he says, so at Oxford, we take, uh, we take a negative and turn it into a positive. We take a problem and we solve it, and then the phone got silent, he so, he said, so, What's your problem, Albert? I said, okay, I do have a problem. So <laughs> my problem is that as I came to know Christ as my Savior as a child and then was discipled and went to Sunday school and Bible study and then answered a call to ministry and went through seminary and started pastoring, all these years, it just seems like we have two teams. We have a team that's interested in your spiritual life and the condition of your soul and whether or not you're ready to meet your maker and go to heaven and be with Jesus you know, evangelism and discipleship and church planting and missions and all that occupies their thinking. Then there's another team over here that they think about the physical stuff, like, are you thirsty? Do you have something to eat? Are you hungry? Do you have something to wear? Do you have a job where you can, you know, earn money for your family and provide? Those are all the temporal things like right now. And it seemed like this team and this team don't, don't always work together. In fact, I've noticed that sometimes they throw rocks at each other, you know. They were supposed to be followers of Jesus, but we don't work together. And I said, my problem is that it's two teams. But when I look at Jesus, it's more like two sides of the same coin. He does both, right? He, he does speak of the kingdom of God in spiritual issues, but he also heals people, gives people to eat, and he, you know, he does the physical things too. And so... That's the problem I want to solve, and I'd like to lift it up in Scripture so that people can see it's in the Bible, in his teaching, and then I would like to use Buckner as uh, our ministry as Exhibit A. So uh, he said, that's a good problem. I'll see you at Oxford. So uh, it took me a while to figure out my problem, so we went there and, and, and so was able to work through and the outline and kind of research the book. So I'd like to share with you this morning what I learned and what I found out. So let's go to Luke chapter 10, the Gospel of Luke. Dr. Luke is a physician, and uh, he's writing uh, chapter 10, verses 1 through 9. I'll read out of the New, Interna New International Version, and this is what it says. <clears throat> After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers and uh, to his harvest field. 
Then he said, verse 3, go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. And if a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking where, whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. And when you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is set before you, heal the sick who are there, and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. And so the, the verses right before this passage, there, there are three people that come up to Jesus and they say to him, I want to follow you, but first I have to go and um, I got to... I have to go and uh, do something. I have to go and take care of my dad. I've got to bury the dead. I've got to go say goodbye to my parents, whatever the excuse is. And Jesus says, no, if you're going to follow me, you just got to follow and don't look back, right? Just go forward. Don't look back. And here we are on the last day of the year. It's not time necessarily to look back. It's time to look forward, right, to the new year that will happen tonight. And so uh, in this passage now, he says, no, those, those are not the ways to follow me. And then the next passage in chapter 10, he talks about the 36 teams of two people he sends out. Now, I'd like for you to go on this journey with me, with these disciples. Jesus said, <clears throat> I'm going to send these two, two by two, to all the places I'm about to go. So I want to stop there and just say that every place you step your foot in 2024, Jesus is already there. He's already in the future. He's already waiting for us. <clears throat> nothing that happens, <clears throat> nothing that happens to you, nothing that happens to me is going to surprise our Lord Jesus Christ. He's, he's already there in the future. He's waiting for us. And so he sends the disciples out to every place that he's about to go. He knows what's going to be there. He knows who they're going to meet. He's already there. He's waiting for them. And so he gives them instructions, and he says, you know, the harvest is plentiful. There's a lot of people that need to have uh, peace of mind and need to have spiritual healing and salvation, and, but we're short on workers. So pray to the Lord to ask him to send more workers. And then he turns around and says, you're the answer to the prayer. You go, right? I'm going to send you out like lambs among wolves. And, you know, just, just travel light. You don't need a purse, a bag, sandals. In fact, don't even say, anybody on, say hi to anybody on the road. Just go to the destination where I'm sending you. And then he gives them talking points. He says, when you get there and you go to the first door, you knock on the door. You knock on that door and even tell them what to say. This is what you're going to say. Peace to this house. And if a man of peace is there, if someone has already been prepared and is receiving the peace that you offer, then, then, then uh, you stay there. Don't move around from house to house. Eat whatever they give you and whatever they give you to drink. And uh, don't move around. And if, if, if a man of peace is not there, he'll come back to you, go on to the next house. So that's kind of a clue of how to, to know when somebody's ready to hear about the message of Christ Jesus has already prepared them. All you have to do is show up and say peace to this house. Now, the kind of peace I'm talking about is from the Prince of Peace, right? The Prince of Peace. It's the peace that he says that Paul says that passes all understanding. In other words, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't compute for common sense, right? So hope comes with peace. That's the first point on the outline there. Uh, there is hope whenever there's peace. And Jesus said, the very first thing you're going to talk to about to people that are around you, your neighbors, your family, your coworkers, your friends, is just about the peace of Christ, but not just any kind of peace, the peace that the Prince of Peace offers. So in the, in the storm, the disciples are on the boat, and it's three or four in the morning, and the storms are raging, the rain is falling, the wind is howling, and they think they're going to drown. Jesus comes up from below deck, and he just says, peace, be still. And the rain stops, the wind stops, the wind stops. Everything is calm. And the same thing happens in your life and in my life. When things are raging and it looks like they're out of control and it looks like there is no way I can get out of this. There's, this is bad news. This is a bad situation. And when you should be frazzled, when you should be freaked out, when you should be stressed, when you should be at your wit's end, maybe even go crazy. At that point, Jesus says, I give you the peace that's way beyond any human understanding. It's a peace that I give. And uh, can you imagine what your relationships would be like in your family, in your uh, friendships, at work, in the workplace, if there was no possibility of peace ever? You just can't have peace, no peace, right? Just conflict. And if you're breathing, still breathing right now, 
you're going to have conflict, maybe even today. Conflict is normal. It, it's okay to have conflict and disagreement. It's how we resolve it that matters, right? The followers of Jesus solve it with the peace of Jesus. And only he can bring peace through forgiveness, restoration, and reconciliation. That's what Jesus did. That's what he did at the cross. Whenever Jesus, born as a child, right, as a baby, and then lived a perfect life, died on the cross, what he was doing was resolving the conflict between you and God, between me and God, with our sin separates us from God. And Jesus dying on the cross, he is the one who then resolves it for us. He took our place and offers us peace. Now we have peace with God. We're reconciled to him. And even on this last day of the year, you can open your heart to Jesus. If you've never done that, you can just say, I, Jesus, I want your peace. I want you to come in. And he resolves that, that conflict between you and God. And it takes care of that. And makes you born again. He gives you a new life. Just like our sister was baptized a moment ago. I'm glad she mentioned in her testimony that she was baptized as a child because infant baptism in that background is a tremendous orientation to the Christian faith. Uh, her parents were at the best way they could introducing her to Jesus and the church and the Christian faith. But then later as she grew up and came as an adult, she realized she needed to respond to Jesus like I'm asking you to do today and to receive him and then be baptized as a believing follower of Jesus as she was. Beautiful testimony today. And so uh, I think that that's available. Jesus gives you peace. And if you're tired and worn out, and it's not working the way you've tried life, then open your heart to Jesus because he will calm the storms. He will give you a peace that just doesn't make sense. It's the peace that passes all understanding. It comes from the Prince of Peace well, that's the first thing Jesus says. When you go and you knock on the door, you say, peace to this house, offer my peace to them. And then he says, when you get to a town and they welcome you and they feed you, you know, like some good food, like, you know, fajitas and rice and beans and good flour tortillas. My mom used to make them where you could feel the flour on the top. So, really, you know, really good. When they give you something good to eat, right, maybe just to give you something to eat. Just eat what they give you. They welcome you. They open their homes, and they give you something to eat. He says, then he says, heal the sick who are there. Now, hope comes with healing, too, right? Hope comes with, not only hope comes with peace, hope comes with healing. Now, what's, what's interesting here is that, um, you know, he, he says, when you, when you get there and they welcome you, then heal the sick who are there. Um, there's all kinds of healing in the Bible that, that if you know the stories of Jesus, remember that that Jairus' daughter had died, and Jesus said, if you'll just come and, you know, it's not too late, you can, you can, you can heal her. So Jesus went to the house of Jared, and, he, uh, uh, and so he, he, he went there. He took his disciples uh, in there, and the girl was asleep. He said, she's not dead. She's just asleep. He said, wake up. So she woke up, and what did he say? Give her something to eat. There's going to be a lot about food this morning. So give her something to eat, you know. So, uh, uh, and so she got up. And then, of course, the blind man couldn't see. Jesus healed his, his eyes. He could see. The one who couldn't walk, he said, pick up your mat and start walking. So um, he, he picked up his mat and he started walking. Um, there, was, uh, there was the woman who had a bleeding issue. And so she touched the hem of his garment. And instantly she, he was, she was healed. The bleeding stopped. There was Lazarus who was flat, dead, cold, out for three days. Jesus said, Lazarus, come out. And so he gets up in his grave clothes, walks out. Every one of those examples is an example of immediate, on-the-spot healing right then and there, no time wasted, right? And you can think of others that you know about. But not here in this verse in chapter 10 of Luke. Not here. He says, heal the sick who are there. Now, the word for healing in the New Testament language is therapuo, therapuo. What does that sound like? Therapy. So Jesus says when you, when you, find, when you find the people who are sick, therapuo them, right? Give them therapy. In other words, it's not going to be on the spot immediate. For some reason, Jesus said it's not going to be immediate. So therapuo, right? Work with them. And like the Good Samaritan uh, he found the wounded man, put them in the hotel, and said, I'm going to pay the expenses, and I'm coming back to check on him, right, to, to, to make sure he's okay. So at Buckner, we work with families and children, and we don't just work with them one time. We work over and over and over and over. 
like you've been to therapy, right? It's not just one stop to see the doctor. You got to go back to the therapist, the PT or the OT or whatever, speech therapist, whatever therapist you have. I've been 36 sessions of uh, cardi cardiac uh, therapy, right? So you got to keep going over and over and over. It's not like that. So Jesus says, you know, therapeutic them, work with them, stay with them. And that's the kind of healing sometimes that is needed. I, I believe healing can happen on the spot if Jesus wants to do that. I believe it can happen through medication, so take your meds. Uh, I believe it can happen through therapy. It can happen through surgery. There's lots of ways that you can heal, and even death is the ultimate healing. Because even the worst thing that can happen to you leads you to the best thing that can happen to you, face to face with our Lord Jesus, right? So there's lots of ways to heal. I remember uh, we were doing a Family Hope Center in Dallas, right above Love Field, and uh, we had four acres of land that we bought, and we were going to build a building and deliver uh, services in the Family Hope Center, but the building wasn't built yet, and so we had, uh, our director had the idea to have a, have a uh, Easter egg hunt, and so the Easter egg hunts in that part of Dallas, uh, there was lots of apartments, but very, very little green space. So people who had green space would invite the community to come and bring their children for Easter egg hunt, $20 a head. And so <laughs> they would charge them a lot of money. So our director said, you know what? I heard that they're charging kids to do Easter egg. We're just going to have a hunt, and it's going to be free. We're going to promote it across the, the community. I said, Ricardo, you're going to have a lot of people there. So we had 1,000 people, 1,100 people show up to that Easter egg hunt, you know, parents and children. I said, I'll tell you what. Since you're going to have such a good response, why don't you have a booth where families can come and receive a free Bible? And, and just, they just fill out a survey, and the survey question would be, number one, do you have a Bible, yes or no? Number two, if you don't have one, would you like a Bible? And number three, if, uh, if you uh, get a Bible, then would you be willing to study the Bible? And number four, if you want to study the Bible, would you, would you host a Bible study for six weeks in your home and we have someone come and uh, you can gather your family and whatever, study the Bible. And the fifth que question was, do you have something you want us to pray about for you? So they, they marked the, all the questions. You know, at the end of that Easter egg hunt, 87, fa 87 families said yes to everything. I thought, oh, no, what are we going to do? I don't have 87 workers that can go lead Bible studies. We're, we're in trouble. So uh, we started getting to them one by one. So I took a Bible to uh, one of the ladies. Her name was Telia Sanchez. She had, she married and had th uh, three little girls. And so we knocked on her door and she answered the door and uh, everything was in Spanish because it's kind of 97% Hispanic in that neighborhood. So we spoke in Spanish and, and she invited us in. And so I said to her, well, we, you know, you asked for a Bible, so here's your Spanish Bible. So I handed it to her. And you know what she said to me? She says, oh, I speak English. I'm like, well, great. <laughs> Here I am struggling through my Spanish, and if I'd have known that, I'd have brought you an English Bible, and I wouldn't be struggling through my Spanish. You know? So I said, okay, I'll tell you what, Telia, we'll bring you another Bible that's in English. So I said, we'll come back. So we said our goodbyes, and we were about to go, and she said, uh, well, wait a minute, aren't you going to pray? I'm like, oh, that's right. We're good. We, you did, you did <laughs> write some things down to pray. I said, so what do you, and I didn't have the paper. I said, what do you want me to pray about? And she got real serious, and she looked at me, and she said, I have bad kidneys, and the doctor said, I don't have long to live. And my mother died of that disease, young. And, and my daughters, they need to have their mother. And, and then she started crying, sobbing almost. She says, I, I don't know what else to do. I've tried everything. I have no hope. And I thought maybe if you prayed that that might help. I said, Okay. We will pray. I'll pray right now. I can't help you, and I can't promise you anything. But I know someone who can heal you. And if it's, it's, if it's his will to heal you, he will, right? So, you know, who knows? I said, maybe meds, maybe a kidney transplant, maybe who knows what. So let's pray. So, Tila, he can heal you right now at the end of my prayer if he wants to. I believe he can. But either way, and I don't know how, we're, we're going to pray. So she called the girls over who were doing their homework. And uh, we got in a circle, and I said, in my tradition as a minister, I like to put my hand on the person's shoulder and pray for their healing. So if that's okay with you, she said, okay. So I did, and, then, and we prayed. And afterwards, uh, you know, she was wiping away the tears, and we had a good time. And she started attending the Bible studies. She had a little bit sense of hope that maybe 
maybe something could happen. So she started going to her doctor more. They looked for solutions. Well, recently she had her kidneys replaced, had a transplant, and, and she's, she's doing okay. But in the meantime, she came to Bible studies. She learned about salvation. She opened her heart to Christ. She said, yes, I want Jesus into my heart to be my Savior and to save my soul. And then she, um, she uh, got through classes. Her husband is a framer. He was a carpenter framer. He framed houses. They always wanted to start a business, so we taught them how to do a business plan and how to make a proposal. So uh, we said, you go up to the builders that are building in North Dallas and Plano, and you offer your services. And she said, well, what if they say no? I said, well, they're probably going to say no, but you're not looking for the no. You're looking for the yes, so you keep asking the next one. Keep going. And so she, they did. And so they got one contract. They got two contracts. They got five contracts. They got ten contracts. He had to start hiring people to frame out the houses. So they're doing really good, you know, financially and everything. So you see the spiritual and the physical came together. So uh, Fertilia, we saw hope in her grow, right, because there was a possibility of healing, and she has been healed. So, so you know, hope comes with peace. Hope comes with healing. But hope also comes with justice. Okay, so now... Just to be biblically accurate, we're going to take a detour. We're going to, we're going to go away from Luke. We're going to go to another scripture that I wrote down there. And you probably know it. From memory, you probably memorized it already. You've seen it and said it a bunch of times. So did I until I found another translation. But you know this verse, right? Uh, Jesus said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will added, be added to you. Right? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things be added to you. Well, when I was looking at that verse at Oxford, I came across some different translations, and I realized that in the Septuagint, uh, the, the word is not righteousness there. The word is justice. And so from the Septuagint, right, uh, to Latin, uh, Greek to Latin, then to English, and of course in Spanish, when the translation comes through, it, it's not righteousness. It's justice. In fact, I'll say it for you in Spanish, and let me see if you can hear the word justice, all right? It'll, it'll just be one verse. I'm not going to preach in Spanish, but I'm going to stumble through my Spanish, all right? Uh, Buscad el reino de Dios. Look for or seek the kingdom of God. Y su justicia and his justice. Y todo lo demás and everything else será añadido, will be added. So there it is in Spanish. Right? But somehow when it got to the King James and the NIV, it came through as righteousness. So now if I go from Latin to Greek or Greek to Latin to Spanish back to English, here's how it would sound as a revised as translation. Seek first the kingdom of God and the justice of God, and all these things will be added to you. Seek first the kingdom of God and the justice of God. And all these things will be added. I'll tell you, when I found that, when I saw it, I thought, where have I been? I've never seen that, you know. I, I never really have thought much about the justice of God. I mean, my dad was in law enforcement, the U.S. Marshal Service. He was a uh, U.S. Marine, right? And so, you know, uh, we didn't have time to get in trouble. <laughs> he, 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 we, were, we had a business, a grocery store. I, you know, learned how to cut meat and sweet, you know, groceries and stock and whatever. We were at church, at school, or we uh, were at work. No time for trouble. And if we were dumb enough to get in trouble, the, we had our U.S. Marshal right there <laughs> ready to tell us what to do. Or he could put us back in the boot camp as a, as a Marine. You know, my dad would say, when I call your name, you start running and say, yes sir, yes sir, until you find me. That's, that's how I grew up. So, but he had this sense about justice, and um, I never really thought about it, to be honest. And so I, th I think, as I think about that, Jesus said there's only one thing that you should chase, justice and his kingdom. Seek first, look after, go for, run after the kingdom of God and the justice of God. So here's how it applies to you and to me today at the verge of 2024. When a follower of Jesus, many of us are here, followers of Jesus, when you encounter a situation where it's not right, you know, it's, it's not just, it's not, it just doesn't seem right, then you should feel uncomfortable. You should feel like something's not right. Like, that's not right. According to the teachings and the ethics of the way of life of Jesus, that is wrong. Something is wrong. And, you know, I'll leave it to you to what to do. Maybe you go in and help. Maybe you make things right. Maybe you pay for someone's groceries or 
whatever you think, you know, Jesus would, would, would lead you to do, right? But, but when we find a child that has no family, we say, that's not right. That, every child deserves a family. So through adoption or foster care, we're going to find them a family. We're not going to find children for families. We're fi- finding families for children, right? And when we see a single mom that's struggling and she's, she can't pay her rent or she can't raise her children, she doesn't have the support economically, financially, we say, that's not right. We're going to help her. We're going to do something. We see a family that's struggling, then we want to do what we can for, so they can have a chance to succeed. That's what I'm talking about. So I think hope comes with justice. A person that is being treated unjustly has hope whenever there's a chance for justice, things to be made right, and we've seen it happen over and over again. I saw a man and a wife, common law marriage, come to us in the valley, because we have a Hope Center in, in, down in the McAllen area, and so she, he shows up with his lady and kids, they're not married, they have common law marriage, and he says, uh, I have a uh, electric bill that I can't pay, and I want you to help me, because I'm leaving her, but I don't want to leave her with the bill. Can you pay this so I can leave? <laughs> like, well, yeah, we can help you with that, but would you like to figure out, you know, uh, would you like to figure out how you don't have to ask for help anymore? He goes, yeah. So we put him, they put him in family coaching for 90 days, and so they went through the goals and everything. 90 days later, he comes back, and we said, okay, you did all your goals. Now, do you want to do another 90-day of goals? And he said, Yes. And I said, okay, let's start with your first goal. He goes, my first goal is I'm going to marry her. And she said, I thought you were leaving. <laughs> and she said, no, I'm not leaving. I'm going to stay and I want to marry you. I think that was a proposal. I'm not really sure. But, <laughs> but uh, so then anyway, so he made his goal. So I told my staff, what happened with that guy in 90 days? I mean, what, what, what could have happened in 90 days that he totally flipped? And so they said, well, it, it's just that we figured out he was good at landscaping. So we got him a job with a landscaper. And then we figured out he's pretty good at management, too, so he got promoted as a supervisor of a landscaping crew. By the time he comes to the second interview of his goals, he's got a job, he's providing, he's got a promotion, he's feeling good. He's feeling good enough to pay his bills and stay and be a dad. That's what happened. He didn't feel qualified to be a dad. That's why he was leaving, to save face. So, so we, we had a situation that was not right. We helped fix it, justice for him and his family. And, uh, and, they, they, and so 12 couples like that said, came, did the same thing. And one time the director called me and said, uh, hey, I've got 12 couples. Remember that first couple? I got 12. They all want to be married. Can, can you come and do the wedding? I said, sure. You do the counseling. I'll do the ceremony. So, so we, we had 12 couples that made a promise to God that they would uh, be faithful in marriage, right? Marriage isn't perfect. Sometimes it breaks down, but at least you have them making that commitment. So my staff said, well, Butner does social services. We don't do weddings, do we? I said, we do now. So, <laughs> so you know, what, what else can you ask for than for the children, for the parents to commit to each other? So, so that's justice. Now, it all comes together, and I'm going to close it now. Then when preacher says, and now in closing, I don't mean 20 more minutes. I really do mean I'm going to wrap it up right here. My dad said, son, when you get up to speak and preach, if you don't strike all in 20 minutes, quit boring. So, so uh and you'll get that later. So, uh, okay, so he says, uh, when you heal the sick, he says, then tell them what to say. Tell them their words. Tell them that the kingdom of God is near you. Now, remember, Matthew 6.33, Jesus said, chase after the kingdom, run after the kingdom, go after the justice of God. Well, in this case, when Jesus the king, the prince of peace, comes into your heart, guess who comes in to live in you? The king does. And you don't have a kingdom without a king, and our king's name is Jesus. So when the king comes in our lives, in our hearts, and we go together anywhere, then the kingdom comes there too, right? And so the kingdom, when he says the kingdom is on you, what he means is it penetrates, it surrounds, it engulfs, it invades, it's all around, it's up, it's down below, it's up inside, it's all sides. The kingdom of God is near you. That's why you got healed, because the king is here. And so this church, Cowboy Fellowship of Atascosa County, is one place where the kingdom of God shows up because the king is here. And I want you to know that as you go into 24, the king living in you, wherever you go, the kingdom goes with you. And peace and healing and justice ought to be close by because the king is with you. And you have his presence. You have the presence of the Holy Spirit with you and in you. And that's really what people want. I think, you know, I've been preaching now for 40 years. 
First time, as I said, you know, and, and the Lord's given me lots of opportunities. And I think now that out in society, people maybe are not that interested in what we have to say. But I figured out that they can't ignore what we do. Right? And so I tell my staff, don't go and start talking about Jesus. We're the messengers with the message. Get into the mess and start fixing it. And when they ask you why, then you say Jesus. Right? You can take a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. But you can put salt tablets in his mouth. So, <laughs> so throw them salt tablets out there, you know, and do for people and serve them like Jesus did and bring the kingdom near and offer peace and healing and justice for them. And when they ask why, Jesus is the answer because his kingdom has come near. And maybe today you'd open your heart and say, man, I want that. I want the peace that passes all understanding. I want healing in my life. I, I want justice in my life. I want all that Jesus has to offer. All you have to do is pray and ask him into your heart. And if you decide to do that, fill out the piece of paper or tell one of the leaders so that we can know and we can help you how to take the next step. So would you stand with me and let's pray as we close today. The group will come uh, in a moment. Uh, Jordan and the praise team did a fantastic job leading us earlier today. I, I needed that worship, Jordan. Thank you for that. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for this church, for the blessing that it is to so many families and so many children, so many senior adults, uh, that uh, regardless of what we face and have faced in this last year, uh, you give us peace, Lord. And you're in the process of healing our lives, our minds, our hearts, our families, our homes, our finances, and everything that is broken. Uh, Lord, you offer healing for us. And and Lord, you also bring justice. You bring what's right and what's, what's uh, according to your teachings and according to the scriptures. And Lord, we, we pray that, that that's the vision that we look forward to as we run after your kingdom, we run after your justice, as we make it available to those around us that this is the higher value, this is the way of living. The people are still asking, what is the best way to live life on the planet? And it's, it's your way. And uh, we, we pray that you'd make us models of that in our homes and families. Help us to model for our children what it means to honor God, to honor our parents and to obey. What it means to follow the rules. What it means to offer respect and dignity to other people, regardless of their background, ethnicity or race. And uh, Lord, this is what you offer and we thank you for it. If anyone here opens their heart today, we pray that you would give them courage to tell someone that they open their hearts to you today. We pray for your blessings. We thank you for all that you're going to do in the new year. And we face it with confidence and boldness, not with fear, but with faith. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen.